Guess what we're talking about today? Prayer. <laughs> this is our new series. We're going to begin on prayer. I haven't decided the title of the series, so we'll get the series title some other time. But today's message is called Prayer Works. I heard this in my spirit, and that's what we're going to talk about. Prayer works. A very simple message, but you need to know this. Prayer works. A lot of people do not believe that prayer works. How many of you have prayed and got answers to prayer? Yes, it definitely works. I remember, I told this before, but it bears repeating. Um, when I first got out of Bible school, um, you know, I came from Rainbow Bible Training Center in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. And of course, the church, I mean, our school about faith and about prayer and the move of the spirit. And I learned a lot in two years. And so it was very amazing. I graduated. So one of the um, passages that Brother Hagen um, is known for is Mark 11, 22, 23, and 24. And that's the passage where it says, have faith in God. And it really should say, have the faith of God. And then he talks about speaking to mountains and believing that the things you say will come to pass. And then he ends with, um, therefore, whatever things you ask for when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. And so I remember being back at home in my apartment, and I remember uh, opening up that passage and walking in my living room, and I said to the Lord, now I'm in my 20s, <laughs> and I said to the Lord, you know, I actually don't really want anything. I just want to see this scripture work. And I said, I'm asking you for $25. I believe I receive it now in Jesus' name. I have my, this is the time we had Bibles open. <laughs> and I believe I receive it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just would thank God for it. That's what I was taught. Um, thank God until the manifestation comes. You claim something. You thank God for it. And within the week, my sister's godfather, Jerry, he's still alive, former <laughs> um, sergeant in the NYPD. Um, he rang the doorbell because he visits. He was visiting my grandmother, I think, or just visiting us, whatever. And as soon as I opened the door, I said, hey, what's up, Jerry? He said, here, Maurice. And he gave me $25. Now, mind you, Jerry has never given me anything. <laughs> All right? Not saying he never did anything for me, but he never gave me money like that. As soon as I opened the door, he said, Maurice, here's $25. I said, why are you giving this to me? He said, I don't know. I just feel like giving you $25. Holy Ghost answered prayer. Somebody say, prayer works. Hallelujah. Woman of God, you can come to your seat. You ain't disturbing nothing. Prayer works. Isn't that an amazing story? So the Lord was showing me, I heard you, and boom, look what I did for you. Praise God. I remember when I was 14, when I first got saved. I never worked before, and I asked God for a job. I prayed. I'm just learning about prayer. I'm 14 years old, just saved. And... Um, um, all of a sudden, this lady, some lady in the building says, oh, you want a job? And you're going to help me deliver papers to people's homes, the Daily News or Newsday or both. I don't know. I think it's both of them. And so I had a job. And I remember being in my kitchen thanking God, like, wow, I had a job. I asked you for a job and you gave me one at 14 years old. I experienced the answer to prayer. Prayer works. So I say glory to God. And then um, there's so many other examples I can give you, but I want to give you those specific ones in my young Christian life that I prayed and it happened. And the same thing is going to be for you. He's going to ask God for things and he's going to give it to you. and He's going to do it for you. Some people have had disappointments in prayer because they say, well, I asked for this, but it didn't happen. Sometimes it really did happen, but you doubted before the manifestation came. Or there's something in your life that's hindered the blessing, but God actually did hear you. Somebody say prayer works. Prayer. Now, there's a lot of other examples in the Bible that we'll look at, but let's start dealing with the uh, why prayer works. You know, I'm a teacher, so I'm going to teach you. So write this down. Is there anybody you have a problem in your, in your right shoulder? Is anybody here you have a problem in your right shoulder? Anybody? All right, cool. Um, if it is, just let me know. 
Let me pray for you. Prayer works, number one, because it's God's ordained way to communicate with him. Prayer works, why? Because it's God's ordained way to communicate with him. Go with me to Genesis chapter 2. Look at verse, I believe it's 7. Look at verse 7. Genesis 2, verse 7. Somebody say, I love the words. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Yes. Of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. And the Lord God what? Formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into him the, his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living being. Now this is Genesis 2. But in Genesis 1, the Bible says, let us make man in our own what? Image. So the reality is you are made in the image of God. So God is, one of the characteristics of God is that he's a speaking spirit. And God created you in his image. So now you are a living soul, but you're also a speaking spirit. So you see animals, the difference between you and animals is that animals have a soul. You can look at them. Their personality, they don't talk no matter what um, Planet of the Apes says. <laughs> animals don't talk. A parakeet can mimic you, but animals don't talk. They have a soul, but this is the difference between you and an animal. An animal is not made in the image of God, and an animal doesn't have a spirit. It doesn't have a spirit. Now, it's, it, it seems as though... Um, the serpent spoke because in Genesis, when, the serp when Satan was in that serpent speaking to Eve, it didn't seem foreign to them that the serpent was talking. But now under the fall of man, you don't see animals talking. But it's possible that they did talk to some level, you know. But regardless, they don't have a spirit. They're not a tripart being. You are a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. You're what? You have a soul and you live in a body. Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. First Peter, take a little theological lesson. First Peter, the apostle Peter um, in the King James says they cause your spirit the hidden man of the heart. In the New King James, it says the hidden person of the heart. I remember thinking about that. I'm like, that's a very strange statement. Then I said, oh, that's very powerful. Because when you look at the book of Genesis, uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, you see the word heart used a lot. Sometimes you see the word spirit used. Sometimes it's used interchangeably. Now, when you see the word heart in the Bible, sometimes it's talking about the spirit of man. Sometimes it's talking about the soul. So, um, Peter, the apostle, says this. He says, the hidden man of the heart. So now... The revelation is this, the heart of man, which is the center of your being, is made of spirit and soul. So um, Peter says, the, I'm sorry, what's the difference between soul and spirit? Okay, the, the spirit is the real you. So if I, forgive me for this, if I shoot you dead right now, your spirit and soul leave your body. Both leave your body. You can't separate them necessarily in your mind or like if I visually see you, I'm not going to see two things. I'm going to see one spirit with a soul ascending because you're born again, you're going to ascend. So it's like intertwined. Yeah, intertwined. That's why in Hebrews, the Bible says the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it divides spirit and soul. And is the discern of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Which means that only the word of God can really divide your spirit and soul. Only the word of God can say, yeah, you're born again, but you need to get that mind renewed. You see, the word of God becomes a mirror. So does that make it clear to you? Right. So you are a spirit. You are a spirit. The real you, I haven't taught on this in a long time, but we're going to teach on that whenever the Lord allows me to. 
The real you is a spirit being. You have a soul and you live in a body. So when God breathed the breath of life into this clay that he created called man, the breath was a spirit, the soul, the soul and the body coming together. I mean, the, the spirit and the soul, the body coming together. Here comes the soul. You see that? Very, very, very powerful. So anyway, um, what was I saying before she interrupted me? No, I'm, just, I'm joking. Um, the hidden man of the heart. So the heart is your spirit and soul together. So the spirit is hidden. The soul is what's seen. The soul is where your personality is, where the way you think, the way you process things. That's what we see. So when we see you, we see your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. You see that? That's what we see. We don't see your spirit, but your spirit is there. That's the real you. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Very powerful. So you are a speaking spirit. Somebody say, I'm a speaking spirit. You talk to God. You talk to God. And that's why prayer is so important because it's the ordained way to communicate with God. God doesn't want you just thinking. He wants you speaking. He doesn't want you just what? He wants you what? Because there's a lot of people who just think. Don't think prayer. Now, God sees your thoughts, but he doesn't want you just thinking. He wants you what? Speaking. The reason why the devil uses the world, social media, circumstances, people, whatever it is, bills, whatever, to keep you from prayer is because he's jealous of you. And he doesn't want you communicating with your heavenly father. Because he got kicked out of heaven. You don't get to talk to God. You don't get to cover him. The Bible says he was anointed cherub that covereth. I'm, I'm using King James language, covereth. Covereth. That's what I grew up with. So sometimes I've got the scriptures in me like that. He covered God. He covered the throne. And when he decided to rebel, you think God was like boxing him? We're on the same level? No. The Bible says, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Some, some preacher said, blink. Everybody blinked. That's how fast he fell. <laughs> fell like lightning. You ever see lightning come? Like that. There's no, we're not even going to have a discussion about this. The Bible says that he was thrown out of heaven by the angel, Michael. You're gone. You lost your place. God creates these human beings with blood. Remember we talked about that? Angels have never seen blood before. They don't know what blood is. He creates these human beings who made his image and likeness. Angels are made his image and likeness. Image and likeness. They're spirits like God, but they don't have his image. We have God's image. We're his kids. Angels can never be his kids. There's a term, and Job says sons of God, but not like how we are the sons of God and how Jesus is the son of God. That's why in Hebrews it says, what time did ever God say to any angel today, I have begotten you as a son. He never did. You're just created beings to worship me, to praise me. You're beautiful. You're gorgeous. You're all that. But none of you are my real children. How do you know that? Because the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that Jesus does not give aid to angels, but to the seed of Abraham. So we're the real covenant children of God. God doesn't have a covenant with angels. They're his servants. Oh, am I a servant of God? In one aspect, you are a servant, but more than a servant, you're a son. You're a daughter of God. Hello, somebody. Isn't that excited? So you get to talk to God. This is the way God wants to talk with you. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? The Bible says they heard the voice of the Lord walking or the sound of God walking in the garden. God created man to have fellowship with him. So one of the things that Satan tries to do over and over again through the world system, through your life circumstances, is to keep you from fellowshipping with God. Going to church is wonderful. It's part of our discipline as Christians, but that is not fellowshipping with God. Fellowshipping with God is when you wake up, say, good morning, Father. Good morning, Lord Jesus. Good morning, Holy Ghost. Amen. 
You're fellowshipping with the Father. You're talking to God throughout the day. Say, Lord, you're amazing. You're beautiful. You're hearing him talk to you. You're feeling him. He's feeling you. You're praising him. Father, I praise you. You're singing songs to him. That's one of the biggest things God loves. He loves songs. That's why praise and worship is the thing that makes us so distinct from every other religion. You ever take time to think about what you're in? Why you're a Christian? Am I a Christian because I was born in America? Or am I a Christian because I'm really dealing with the true and the living God? You should examine that. You have to know your own faith. You have to know what you believe, why you believe it. One of the things I did when I was younger, I said, it's very remarkable that in all the other religions, they do sing, in, in particular Jews, because they, we come out of that, but they don't worship like us. There's no religion that has the kind of worship we have. I said, what is that? Because we're in tune with the true and the living God. Study all the religions, any religion you can find, the old ones, the new ones, no religion worships like the Christian. They may pray, have their little formula, <laughs> but they don't have this flow from the spirit to God and from God's spirit to us. Have you noticed that? There's no maverick city in, an, in another religion. There's another, another group that comes up, and then another group that comes up, another group. Because when you're dealing with the true and the living God, there's always going to be a flow of worship. Always a new song. The Bible says in heaven they sing a new song to the Lord. You notice we always have new songs? <laughs> you notice no other religion has new songs? They're always singing some old thing. We always have new songs, new melodies. Kirk Rung said, melodies from heaven. Rain down. Okay. Some of you don't remember that. That's all right. Number two. Prayer works because God loves to answer people's prayers. If you have a picture that God doesn't want to hear you, God doesn't want to hear your prayers, that is false. The Bible says that God delights in the prayers of the righteous. He what? Delights. Which means that it makes him happy. He's excited when you talk to him. He's excited when he hears from you. He's excited when you ask for things from him. Now, some of you may have grown up in a home where your parents say, stop asking me for stuff. Don't raise your hand if that was you. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, 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 somebody raise their hand. Ah, yeah, that's me. But um, God is not like that. He's not like your mother. He's not like your father. Now, most parents, they're generous, but sometimes they get frustrated if the bills get too much. God doesn't have bills that get too much for him. Hello? God doesn't have a budget. <laughs> Nobody's paying the father a salary. So I listen, I can't buy you that sneaker today. I tell people all the time, I tell kids who are born again, if your parent can't afford it, you have a heavenly father. God's not limited to your parents. And the primary way he'll take care of you is through your parents, but he's not limited to your parents. If you have a relationship with God, what you do, you go to God. There's no... No, no, uh, <laughs> there's no, God doesn't have grandchildren. He doesn't have stepkids. He has children only. So that five-year-old, that 10-year-old, they're born again. They're a child of God. And they can go to their father and say, Lord, I want this. And he'll send a raven. He'll send another person with what they want. I tell kids that all the time. And you should tell your children that. Say, honey, I can't afford it right now. Oh, I don't have it right now, but you can always go to the Father. He will hear your voice. Train your children to talk to God and to not just look to you as their source, but him as their source and you just a resource. And if you train them in this now, when they get older, it won't be a problem when, when they're older to go to God and believe him for things. God doesn't get tired of hearing you. You know, sometimes your parents will say, oh, you talk too much. Oh, my God. My niece is telling me now that my great niece... Uh, Madison, oh my gosh, she's just talking so much. She's like her, her grandmother. <laughs> you know, but God never feels, oh, you're talking too much. Never. He likes to hear from you. He's the omnipresent, omnipotent, unlimited father Amen. who loves to hear people pray. So uh, now, now uh, it's very interesting. Uh, Mom, the late Miles Monroe I watched him in an interview with Benny Hinn many years ago, and he said, it's interesting how God has one side of the world up and the other side of the world sleeping. And when the other world is sleeping, we're up. 
He says, you know why? He says he believes one of the reasons is so that someone in the world is always praying. There's never a time that there's someone not praying. And we can, we can say that for other things. Someone, there's always a time someone's not using their potential. One side is up working, the other one is sleeping. When the other one is sleeping, the other side is working. God likes to see prayer and he likes to see potential manifested. But we're not talking about potential right now. We're talking about prayer. He always wants to hear from his people. Come on. We have, we have, we have a lot to say about that. Um, but we'll get to that some other time. We'll talk about the prayers in a golden bowl that signifies how divine and how important your prayers are to the Father. But 1 Peter 3.12 Saying prayer works because God loves to answer people's prayers. First Peter 3 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. His ears are what? Open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So tell all the drug dealers, the face of the Lord is against you. Tell all the prostitutes, the face of the Lord is against you. Now he loves them, but my face is I'm not favoring that kind of behavior. To all the human traffickers, I died for you, but my son died for you, but I'm not hearing that. All the kidnappers, all the people making money, all the gamblers, everybody who's doing all the kind of wickedness that's in the world, I'm not down with that. My face is against you. All the politicians who are lying, who are stealing their country's money, my face is against you. But the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. So God sees you 24-7, seven days a week. There's never a moment God is not with eyes on you. Oh, yeah, God's eyes on me when I'm in church. No, it's not. His eyes on you. Uh, yeah, it is true, but his eyes on you when you're in the bathroom. When you're peeing, when you're doing number two, when you're taking a shower, when you're in the tub, God's eyes are on you. Here we go. Some people don't like this, but I like to do this to stir up the religious spirit. When you're having sex, God's eyes are on you. He's like, oh, have a good time. Whoa. <laughs> oh, they enjoyed that. <laughs> I would say praise the Lord. God doesn't say praise the Lord to himself. W why did I say that? Because the religious mind or the carnal mind will put God in one little category, church. He is the omnipresent God. And don't forget, like I say this a thousand times, I'll keep saying it until I stop preaching. God gave you your sexual drive and hello, he gave you your body parts. So anything that you are enjoying in marriage, praise God, <laughs> comes from him. Doesn't it come from the devil. You didn't make it up. Did you give yourself a vagina or a penis? Yes or no? It came from God the Father. It came from Jesus. Yeah, your sweet Jesus that you see in a baby manger for Christmas, that you see on the cross, that you're put in one little category. He's the one who gave you that. And he's the one who sees you operating in that. That's why he has rules on it. And it's a right to have rules on it. Why? Because he gave it to you. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, science wants to be God. They want to create. You can't create. You can manipulate what God has already created, but you can't create. Can you create an egg in a woman? No. Can you create sperm in a man? No. Comes from heaven. Comes from the Father God. That's why you have to remove the carnal mind and put God in everything. I know one guy who, before he got married, he talked to the Lord about his sex life and how he wanted to perform. And guess what he told me? God blessed him with what he asked for. See, if you put the God in a religious box, you won't pray to God about your sex life. Come on, somebody. Now, a lot of people need to talk to God about their sex life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Lord, make this thing jump. <laughs> Glory to God. Make this thing better. In marriage, of course. Am I, have I disturbed the religious thinking enough? I hope so. Because I, I've, known, I've been a Christian for a very long time, three decades, and I've seen a lot of religious 
Christmas that is not from heaven. It was God who said in the book of Leviticus how your sexual life should be. He's the one who said, you don't sleep with your aunt. He's the one who said, you don't sleep with your kids. You see that? God has a very big interest in your sexual life. People say, why church always talking about people's sex life? Because God talks about people's sex life. (laughs) Ain't nobody's business. Oh, yes, it is. Because he gave you the body. He gave you life. Come on, somebody. All right. People's like, oh, could you move on? No, we can stay right there. Break down that wall. Matthew 7, verse 7 to 11. We're going over point two, prayer works because God loves to answer people's prayers. Somebody say, God loves to answer my prayers. God loves to answer my prayers. Okay, verse 7. Now, a lot of preachers water this down, but don't water it down. I'm going to sit down now. I feel like sitting down. <laughs> Earlier, I asked if anybody has a problem in their right shoulder uh, and also in your right neck area. Anybody have that problem in the right shoulder or the right neck area? All right. If it is you, let me know. Um, Ask and it will be given to you. Are you there with me at Matthew 7? Ask and it will be given to you. Let's just start right there. Are you reading it with me? Ask, and it will be given to you. This is Jesus speaking to an audience. This is what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about everything, divorce, marriage. He's talking about your attitude. He's talking about, and now he gets into prayer. This is like one of those sermons. He had everything in it. (laughs) Ask, and it will be given to you. Do you believe that? Is Jesus a liar? No. So if you're not getting answers to prayer, that means it's not a problem with the Lord, it's a problem somewhere with you. You need to find out, Lord, what is, what is the hindrance? Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. So Jesus promises that when you ask, it will be given to you. When you seek, you're going to find what you're looking for. And if you knock, you know, you're not, the door will be open to you. Verse eight, for everyone who asks, receives. Oh yeah, he'll answer Pastor Maurice, he'll answer Pastor Sam, he'll answer Pastor Patrick, he'll answer Pastor Fabian, he'll answer Pastor Josh, he'll answer uh, uh, Rachel, but he's going to answer me. Lies. Oh, he answers my, my, my mother's prayers. Oh, he answers my grandmother's prayers. Lies. Religious lies. For everyone, what does it say? What does it say? Say it again. Who asks, receives. Which means it's an even playing ground, even field. And he who seeks finds, and to him knocks, it will be open. So he reemphasized verses 7 and verse 8, and then he says, Or what man is there among you? Who? And by the way, that verse 7 and 8 is not a one up. If you look at it in the Hebrew, it says, I mean, in the Greek, it says, Whoever asks and keeps on asking, whoever seeks and keeps on seeking, whoever knocks and keeps on knocking, the Amplified bears that out. The Amplified Bible, classic. So you're asking. And getting an answer to prayer, oh, God answered my prayer um, five years ago. Okay, what has happened in the last five years? God wants to answer you all the time, every week, every month, every year. You have a list of things you ask God for that has come to pass. At the end of the year, you should be able to say, I asked God for this and this happened. Or I prayed for this and this happened. Or I prayed for that person and that happened. You should have a list. So one of the things that I would encourage you to do Let's have a prayer journal. Start writing down what God did for you, what day he did it. The day you prayed, the day it it was manifested. Amen. Amen. Oh, my goodness. I just realized. (laughs) Oh, my gosh. Oh, my Lord. (laughs) 
You know, people walked in, I didn't realize. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Hallelujah. I'm going to let you guys say something at the end when you're ready. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Wow. Okay, so he says, um, or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, Jesus is talking to this audience. Now, remember, this is before the cross. This is before the blood stained that tree. This is before the new covenant has been ushered in. Jesus has given this emphatic promise. How much more sense is this a reality? So what is Jesus talking about? So he says, he's talking to this audience. These are, non, these are Jewish people who are not born again. He says, what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? If your son asks you for a piece of bread, you're not going to give him a stone, are you? If your kids ask you for um, um, bread, you're going to give them uh, rice. Well, that, 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 that's, that, that's not a good comparison. If your kid asks you for a bread, you're, you're not going to give them a rock, are you? No, mom, I asked for bread. What, what do you give me a rock for? Eat that rock. <laughs> no, you're not going to do that. Jesus is saying, you being just a human being are not going to give your kid something that they didn't ask for. And in this case, it, it goes even a little deeper. Some of you know this, I've taught this before. When Jesus said um, bread, there was a stone at that time, because the way they made their bread is different from our, it wasn't the loaf of bread that we have. The stone looked like a bread. There was a stone that looked like bread. So Jesus said, the father is not going to even give you something that looks like what you asked for. Hello, somebody. He's not a discount God. He's not a no-frills God. You wanted Cheerios, but we gave you chill O's. <laughs> you want something from, from Target and Walmart, but we gave you something from the dollar store. Sorry. Or if he asked for a fish, will he give him a serpent? There was a serpent that could coil itself and look like a fish. Or he said, if you, being evil, know how to give gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So what do you have to do? Ask. And if you've been disappointed in prayer before, you need to erase that disappointment, realize that God is never the problem, get Kenneth Hagin's book called Don't Blame God, Learn that to, never to never blame God and always say, well, there's never a problem on the giving end. There's a problem on the receiving end, and I need to deal with that. So, for example, one time, Kenneth Hagin, he's preaching around. He's God's prophet and teacher, moving in the spirit, people getting healed, all kinds of wonderful things are happening. But he notices that there's a um, problem financially, provision-wise. So he goes on a three-day fast. Because he recognized that God is never the problem. I, there must be something on my end. So he goes to seek God. And I think on the second day or the third day, he says, God answers him. And he says, he said, your word, because Brother Higgins is bringing this to him. He said, you said in your word that if I'm willing and obedient, I will eat the good of the land. My, I'm not eating the good of the land. My kids are not properly clothed. We don't have all the things that we're supposed to have. And what's the problem? I'm serving you. And the Lord spoke to him and says, Oh, to get this scripture, you have to fulfill the whole thing. He says, you are obedient, but you're not willing. You don't want to do what you're doing. The Lord examined right to his heart. He said, I got willing that fast. <laughs> and everything turned around. Because God doesn't just look on the outward. Did he tell the prophet that? He looks at the heart. So if you want to eat the good of the land, you want to have God's best in your life, be willing and obedient. And there's some people who are willing, but they never obey. You got to have both in operation. Amen? 
oh, I want to tithe, but you don't tithe. Oh, I tithe, but I don't want to do it. So how are you going to reap the benefits of tithing? If you're not willing, but you're obedient, or you're willing, but you're not obedient. You've got to have both. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. All right. So God will give you what you ask for. Number three, we're almost done. We're talking about prayer works. And we'll tell you why prayer works. So we said first, prayer works because it's God's ordained way to communicate with him. Two, prayer works because God loves to answer people's prayers. Three, prayer works because God is faithful. Your friend may not be faithful. Mama may not, may not be faithful. Daddy might not be faithful. They may be a little faithful or halfway faithful. God is always faithful. Hallelujah, somebody. The prophet said, God is not a man that he should lie. God is not a what? Man. That he should lie. He don't have to lie. He ain't afraid of you. And he's not a deceiver. One apostle wrote, from the God who cannot lie. God cannot lie. It's not in his nature to lie. So, the scripture, so that scripture says, God's not a man that he should lie. If he said it, will he not do it? If he spoke it, will he not bring it to pass? And the answer is yes. First Thessalonians 5.24 Paul is releasing some kind of prayer over the Thessalonians about being preserved, spirit, soul, and body until the coming of the Lord Jesus. And then he ends it with this. In verse 24, he says, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. You've been called in the darkness into this marvelous light. God's call is on your life. Just as a Christian, he's called you into his kingdom. And if he has done that, the Bible says, he will do it. He is faithful. Whatever you ask for that's in line with his word, in line with his will, he will do it for you. He will give you the desires of your heart. You need to hear that more. You need to tell yourself that. When the other religious world is telling you no, when the devil is telling you no, you have to tell yourself yes. Amen. Psalm, 20, Psalm 37 verse 3 says this. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land. In other words, live, man, and feed on his faithfulness. A lot of people are not feeding on God's faithfulness. One day, um, the Lord spoke to me, and he said something very powerful. Um, sometimes I have impressions. That's the primary way God leads us, by our inner man, by impressions of the Spirit, what we call the inward witness. But other times, you're going to hear that still, small voice, like a whisper. Other times you're going to hear the authoritative voice of the Holy Spirit where you hear him very clearly. It's not even, you know, a doubt. I remember one time I was laying in my bed, uh, just laying in my bed, you know, and I heard the Spirit of God. It's like almost somebody's talking in your ear, but it's in the inner man. Get to your next. That was a few years ago. I haven't really got to my next, but it's all right. We're on our way. <laughs> it was a command. One time, I told you this, I was watching um, Race, the, the, the Jesse Owens story. Those of my generation know the Jesse Owens story. Some of the younger ones don't know it, but you should know the Jesse Owens story. That's the guy who was in the Olympics during um, Hitler's time, and he won against Hitler's people in Germany. But anyway, I finished watching it, and I was sitting in my chair. This when I lived in the, my other apartment. I was sitting in this big chair I had. I had TV in the living room, but TV in my bedroom, too. I grew up like that, so I like that. And a chair. And as soon as I turned it off, I heard a voice. It startled me a little bit. And I heard it just like this. Grand. Ah. The Lord said, do you know why I give men favor? I was so shocked that I was hearing this voice that I was like startled. Before I could answer, the Lord said, because the world is unfair. And I knew it was based off of this thing that I saw. And I was, I was stunned. I'm still stunned when I think about it. I mean, it was like somebody standing in my room. He said, do you know why I give men favor? 
And before I could answer, he said, because the world is unfair. Now, the reason I bring that up is because I heard this voice also say to me one day, I was about to put a statement on Facebook, you know, the Facebook stuff, and I heard the Lord speak to me. And he said, life is to be lived, not looked at. And I was like, oh. So I know what he was saying. You're spending all your time looking at social media, writing on social media, but you're not living. I never forgot that. That's a word for you. Come on, somebody. Life is to be what? Lived, not looked at. Are you looking at life or are you living life? And that is like, I'm, I'm living my life. Forget those kids. Because we can't say what Anthony really says on social media. Amen. <laughs> we, 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 we live in our lives. We go on our next vacation without the kids. All right. It's not just about vacation. It's about your every day. Are you just going to work, coming home, cooking dinner, going through a boring routine? Now, we have to have a routine, but it doesn't have to be boring. Do something that's causing you to dwell in the land. God gave You were born in America. People around the world want to be here. You were born here. Live. Or if you came here, you know, later in your life, live. Wherever you're at, live. Even when Israel was in um, um, slavery, God said, stop moping. You're in slavery. You ain't getting out for another 70 years. I don't care what your prophets are telling you. They're lying to you. They're dreaming their own dreams and prophesying their own words. You're not giving out until 70 years is up. But while you're here, plant, have some kids, build houses, build vineyards, and live. Amen? Amen. Now, this is it. That's, that's, so this is what the scripture is saying. Dwell in the land and what? Feed on his faithfulness. God is faithful no matter where you're at in life, no matter where you're at on your journey, and he will take care of you. He will do what he said he would do. He will bless you because God is what? Faithful. That means he's super loyal. If you start praising him and thanking him for his loyalty and not listen to the devil's lies, you're going to be amazed. And wow, God is really faithful. You start worshiping him. The Bible says worship and spirit and truth. One of the truths we should worship him is that he's faithful. He's reliable. He's dependable. He's super loyal. God loves to hear him being praised for that. And the more you praise him for that and magnify that aspect of his character, the less the devil can lie to you and deceive you. Because the devil did that with Eve. God's not really that good. Has he really said this? She was deceived. Adam transgressed. He knew he was doing wrong. Don't let the devil deceive you. Amen? So, now, when I, I, now I wrote this down. If he wasn't faithful, prayer wouldn't work. If he wasn't faithful, you'd have no guarantees. The Bible says we have a better covenant established on a better promises. And all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. God is faithful. And here's the last one. Prayer works because, number four, because you've been granted unending access. Prayer wouldn't work if God didn't give you access to him. Access, remember um, BET used to do this thing, the show called Access Granted? In the kingdom, it's access granted. There's an access you didn't have before the cross that you have now. There's an access even Israel didn't have before the cross that they have now if they're born again. You have access to the very presence of God. That presence that had a curtain with cherubims on it that you could not enter through, that if you did try to go into it, you would die instantly because you had no access. Only the high priest, not even the priest, only the high priest could enter it one time a year and with great caution because nobody had access to the very presence of God. And the curtain. The Bible says when Jesus died, <coughs> that the curtain 
was ripped in the temple from top to bottom. Not from bottom to top. That's man. Ripped from top to bottom. Angels of God himself ripped the curtain and now man was free to come into the presence of God. This is why it is super stupid for you not to pray <laughs> under the new covenant. One day, I was making my bed in my bedroom, my master bedroom. <laughs> and I heard the voice of the Lord again. You be hearing God a lot. I sure do. I dream a lot too. Pastor Ernst, I was telling him some dreams. He says, my God, how many dreams do you have? <laughs> One day I said, oh, said, do you remember that dream I told you? He said, Pastor, you have so many dreams. I don't remember all of those dreams. You told me so many. But I heard his voice again. And he said, prayerlessness is wasted access. I was like, oh my God, did I just hear God just now? Prayerlessness is wasted access. I never heard a preacher say that. I never, heard, I never said it before. I heard those words, unforgettable. I wrote it down. I have to write it down because I, I can't forget it. So when you don't pray, you're wasting your access. You're wasting your right to approach the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the God of glory. You're wasting your access to the majesty of the heavens. Do you know that when you are praying, you're actually talking to the God of heaven and of earth? You're actually talking to the sovereign king, the one who does an inapproachable light, who's invisible but can see you, and he hears you? Don't waste your, waste your access by being so busy. So busy, 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 busy. You can't talk to the Father. Can't even access. Can't even fellowship with Him. Take advantage of your access and pray. Let the devil tremble because you are a woman or a man of prayer. I don't got time to pray. If you don't have time to pray, you are out of sync. You don't want to go to heaven and the records, the books are open. And you ain't hardly ever prayed. <laughs> never prayed for yourself, never prayed for other people. You in heaven, come on, enter in, y'all. But where's your prayers? I remember um, Jesus talking to Mary Baxter in her book, Divine Revelation of Hell, a woman who evidently committed the sin to death and no longer was a believer and actually was in the region of the damned. But he said to, to, to Mary Baxter, this woman, because what happened was she let bitterness into her heart because it was something her husband did, and she actually ended up killing him. Now, murder is not the end of salvation, but evidently, without Jesus telling us the whole details, she must have committed the sinner to death because the only way you can go to hell after being a believer, when you reject Jesus, and then you're no longer born again and you go to hell. You can't be saved and go to hell. This is impossible. I don't care what nobody tells you. So anyway, it doesn't make any biblical sense. But anyway, Jesus said something very powerful. He said, this woman who was once a daughter of mine, she got many prayers answered. I took note of that. Now you can read the book for the other stuff, but I take notes of different things. He said she got many prayers answered. I have a question for you. Are you getting many prayers answered? Are you praying in a way where you're getting prayers answered for yourself and for other people? During this 21 days of prayer that we're starting tomorrow, let that be your new testimony. I've got many prayers answered. Become a huge threat to the devil. <laughs> let, him stop, let him stop stomping all over you. Like a big bully in, in, in the lunchroom, stealing your lunch. Give me your lunch. No, be a bully to him. Punch him in the face. Give me that soul back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what happened to me? You want to know something that happened to me um, this week? I don't know. I mean, because of my time in the presence of God, I guess I'm super sensitive. I'm always crying. But something happened that I never, I haven't, I haven't experienced in a little while. I guess you would call it the spirit of intercession. You know, as a matter of fact, I can feel the, the tears now. I'm going to hold it. Jesus, please. 
I began to weep and weep and cry for that 14 year old that killed those people in Georgia. I saw the news and when I saw it and I saw him in the court, you couldn't see his face, you couldn't see his hair. I began to cry. I mean, cry, like cry, cry. And I, could, I was trying to like <laughs> stop it. I couldn't stop. I began to pray for his salvation. I even prayed for his dad who they also arrested and they should have. I, I said, God, he's going to hell. Save him. He's going to hell. Save him. I began to cry and weep over not only him, but the generation that's using these weapons that are, that are angry, that are being deceived by the devil, that are destroying their lives for no reason. I even say, Lord, come quickly, Lord Jesus, what, what John prayed in the, in, um, in the end of John. Come quickly. Fix this whole world. But I began to weep and cry and weep and cry and pray for him and his dad's salvation. That's the spirit of intercession. That's the heart of God. That's not me. That's the heart of God praying through me for them. Let's pray. Let's pray. A lot of people throwing their lives away. And we need to pray. Here's a scripture for the access part. Ephesians 2, 18. For through him, we have both access by one spirit to the Father. So we have access because of Jesus. That's why Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but through me. Your only access is because of Jesus. That's why you pray to the Father in his name, which we'll talk about during this series. Amen? Amen. Everybody shout, prayer works. Prayer works. Are you excited about that? God bless you. Come on and welcome Pastor Sam.